Welcome to the Daily Objective. Quite often, you've seen us uh, having episodes where we rebut articles. Someone wrote something about Ayn Rand, and uh, we are angry and we say why it's uh, why it's wrong. Today is a different occasion, so we will respond, so to speak, to an article written about Ayn Rand. But this time, we have with us the author of this uh, article, and the author is Paul Krieder. And the article appeared in Liberal Currents, and the title is Liberalism versus Reaction in Ayn Rand. So, Paul, thank you very much for being uh, for being with us. Let me give very quickly the how I understood the article for the people who haven't read it, and then you'll have the time to tell us uh, why you wrote it, what's your intellectual journey, and all that stuff. So. Sure. Why I found the article interesting. First of all, I think that there's an honest attempt by Paul to engage with the ideas of Rand. But most importantly, the personal connection is I see the article as, let's say, a progressive trying to make sense of the good things in Ayn Rand, the good things in terms of from his point of view. And this is how I came across Ayn Rand. So in a way, that's how I, with the point of view that you wrote this article, is the point of view I read Atlas Shrugged uh, now eight years ago. But why don't you tell us a bit more about your intellectual journey, who you are? So you're an engineer, but also uh, someone who deals with intellectual work. You, you've written also another article recently about classical liberalism and libertarianism. So tell us something a bit more about yourself. Sure. So uh, I am an engineer in uh, the Bay Area of California. Um, that's my my daytime job. Um, but as a as a hobbyist, I think of myself as a student of liberalism um, and an advocate. And uh, several years ago, I guess about five years ago, uh, with a couple buddies, I started uh, Liberal Currents. So I'm one of the founding editors of it, and it thinks of itself as we think of ourselves as. Um, making sense uh, of, of liberalism in the 21st century and defending it against um, threats against it. Good. Um, do you want me to go into my, like how I discovered Ayn Rand? And, and yeah, tell whole... us a bit about uh, about uh, your relationship to with Ayn Rand, which if I understand goes way behind and also why you, de- why you decided to write this article and who is it for, let's say. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I read Ayn Rand in high school. I started with Atlas Shrugged in 10th grade, um, and I just immediately glommed onto the ideas. I, I fell in love with Rand and Atlas Shrugged, and I read The Fountainhead, and I you know, read some of her nonfiction. Um, uh, I guess I never really considered myself quite an objectivist. You know, there's always something a little bit in the way. Like when I first read Ayn Rand, I, I still believed in God. I, I it was sort of still religious. Um, eventually, I became an atheist, but then I I, uh, I got into kind of harder core libertarianism, and I, I was an anarcho capitalist in in uh, college uh, for several years. Um, and you know, now I agree with with Rand that anarchism is a is a floating abstraction. Um, but then uh, you know, just over the years, uh, just by talking to a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, with a lot of different ideas, and reading a whole lot. Um, my, my libertarianism turned into sort of like, uh, I don't know if you remember the bleeding heart libertarians from, from several years ago. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, gradually that even kind of fell away. And I just think of myself as a, as a liberal, um, and, uh, you know, just liberal simpliciter. Um, and, uh, I, I guess my personal passion is, um, finding room and defending the left side of liberalism because I think it's always been there, right? Um, and it's and it's it's worth worth defending. So let's jump then in the in the article. So the article, in a way, are you writing to make a point? So let me give also an, another. Let's say the theme of the article. So your theme in the article is that although Ayn Rand is considered part of the classical liberal tradition that you believe that she's more of a heterodox conservative rather than as someone who is in the classical liberal tradition. At the same time though, so you're a bit like what Marx does in the beginning of the manifesto where he starts by praising, let's say capitalism and then he he gets to to the offensive. So you start by saying that 
rant uh, has all these good things, but then you point the attention to the things that you consider uh, problematic. So the question is, is this an article that is, that is saying to fellow, let's say, let's say progressive liberals, that there's something there in rant, despite the problems that you might have in rant? Or is this an article saying to liberals, Keep, be careful because Ayn Rand is not really a liberal, but she's more of a conservative. Or is it a bit of both? It's really a bit of both. Um, I, I had multiple audiences in mind, which is always really difficult for a piece. Um, so I, even though I'm very far from, from Rand now in, in just you know, kind of contemporary politics, um, I'm really frustrated because whenever you read about Rand, it tends to be gung-ho supporters or people who are just like vicious attackers who often don't really understand her ideas. And they, they, they betray that they don't understand her ideas just by getting basic things wrong. Um, and so that's frustrating to me because I think Rand is interesting. Like at the very least, Rand is, is extremely interesting and um, not only interesting, but, but brilliant in a lot of ways, um, even though she doesn't, like one way I said it uh, on on Twitter was was Rand is a little bit like um, uh, like Iron Man. Um, you know she you know she built this entire philosophical system you know with a box of scraps in the desert, right? So um, it, it's incredible what she accomplished um, without having like an entire ideological edifice to to kind of start from. Um, so I I do want to say to um, progressives uh, and and kind of left liberals and and so forth that uh, Rand is interesting and and you shouldn't discard her um, and another thing is I guess I wanted to defend the idea that every once in a while you you find some progressive uh, who says oh yeah you know I like that list drug and then you see this like pile on right so like Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. has happened a, a few years ago and like you get all of these hot takes like is Stacey Abrams like really who we thought she was and all this stuff but I mean it makes perfect sense to me. And so I hope my article uh, kind of explains how somebody, even with quite different values on a superficial level can, can still find resonances in Rand. Right. Um, and on what you said in terms of leftist understanding uh, Rand, I was surprised how well Zizek understood that last rag. So every now and then he told, there was a particular time around his discussion with Peterson where he talked about that last rag then without giving spoilers, he seemed to me as someone who actually understood it better than many conservatives or even many, many libertarians. So I have to now, though, take you, push you a bit on the, on the points that you make in the article, and let's discuss yeah, our, yeah, sure. our disagreement. So actually, before I get to the, to the actual points that I have figured out, why don't you give us, in a, in a, in a kind of condensed form, what is your major objection either with Rand as a person or more interestingly I think for for the discussion in terms of what's your major objection with objectivism so you're someone you describe yourself as someone who tries to keep let's say the message and the spirit of classical liberalism mm -hmm. so what is your main beef with objectivism then um so so well I wouldn't call myself a classical liberal um I'm interested in classical liberalism but okay. I just am a liberal um so uh, I think of Rand as a kind of ideal theorist. Um, so I, I view her as she starts from these sort of Aristotelian premises and uh, tries to come up with, with um, kind of this, this thick ethical defense of, of um, the kind of world that she wants to see, that she wants to live in, that she thinks that human, humans need in order to, to survive um as as humans um and so she has this ideal theory but then um what and i have some quibbles there but then she um and applying it to the real world in the real world never nef nothing is ever exactly like the ideal and so she finds things that um she sort of just like forces into her ideal uh model that don't really necessarily fit very well. Um, so an example of this is um, like just America, for example. So uh, Rand and, and objectivists are big, you know, kind of America boosters. 
and that's fine. And in a way, there are a lot of good things about America, um, but it prevents them from from seeing some, you know, bad things that America has done. And it not only, you know, they might acknowledge some things on a superficial level, but it causes them to get other things wrong. Um, like Rand gets America's uh, racial history really wrong, and she just ignores it. Like she, more than getting it wrong, she just kind of like doesn't talk about it, doesn't find it important. But in terms of human freedom, uh, there are a lot of things in America's racial history that are extremely uh, problematic and still causing um, unfreedom today, still major sources of unfreedom today. Um, so that's, that's kind of one thing. And, and part of her, uh, part of her, uh, ideal theory is, is, um, you know, starting from Aristotelian premises, like she creates this, um, comprehensive worldview. So it's not like a kind of a basic political liberalism and, and a defensive political liberalism. It, it starts from this, like I said, a thick ethical, um, you know, set of beliefs. And there are, tensions in in ran like in atlas shrugged especially um you you see this story uh where um you basically have to uh abide by this entire ethical system um kind of whole hog um and it doesn't really deal with uh objectors um or people who who you know just have different views uh, very well. Okay, that's that's interesting. So before we jump into Atlas Rag, let's first deal with the first uh, objection. So I will tell you where I disagree with you and where I, I see your point. So I think a main difference that we would have is how we view Rand. So I think in your article, you mostly view her as a mainly a political philosopher, as someone who builds a political system. And also, what I have to say, because my main interest is politics, first, my first reading, particularly of Atlas Shrugged, was exactly this. So I was taken, uh, I, I found so exciting this idea of the people who were on strike as a vanguard. You mentioned it in the article. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing that got me. But I would challenge the point that says that Rand creates this, uh, let's say, ideal society, because I don't think that Rand starts from politics. I would say that Rand starts with First of all, what should be the way that you live your life and mm -hmm. what should be the, let's say, a way to live as a human being on earth based on what are your needs and all that stuff. And then, so first, you know, what is the nature of reality? For example, do we have, uh, do we get into contact with faith or with reason? Then how do we need to carry ourselves, let's say, to the world? And only then comes the, the, the question of politics. So I agree with point, that, by the way. Sorry? I, I agree with that, by the way. You're right that yeah. she starts from. Yeah. So that's why I wouldn't, I wouldn't see her as... A, so you mentioned somewhere in the text, and I, I, I found this interesting, and I, I underline it says, uh, she fashioned the perfectionist political doctrine but of truly human flourishing, sweeping away of the Marxist monopoly on such rhetoric. So I found this interesting. So indeed, we could call it, let's say, a perfectionist doctrine of human flourishing, but I think it's more in the, in the space of morality and politics is more like a, a derivative. So that's, that would be one, one, uh, one disagreement. Let's go then to, do you want to discuss now Atlas Rugged and uh, you started saying something about uh, your... Uh, Oh, sorry. We also need to mention the issue of, uh, of race, because I think that's very, very important. Because recently I was teaching through an, uh, the Ayn Rand University, a module called The Road to Critical Race Theory, and we had various classes on race. So, and the question that was raised was also by myself, does Ayn Rand has a blind spot for racial injustices in the United States in the 50s and the 60s? And the answer I would say is, Perhaps yes, but I wouldn't say that this is because of uh, not considered it important. Because after all, she wrote an article on the issue of race that I considered one of the best philosophical attacks on racism. And also, coming back to the issue of American history, the, her absolute disgust for the South and her support for, uh, for the Civil War as something that was almost bound to happen because of this huge contradiction 
Uh, I think this puts into perspective the fact that, yes, I think she has a blind spot for things like redlining, and I think you mentioned it also in the article. But the yep. question is, why is that? Is this because she considers racism not a big evil? And I would say the answer here is no. And you also mentioned American history and this idealized version. I would say this is, again, in a way correct, but not idealized version in terms of not focusing on the big evils like slavery again, but I think more on the level of principles, on the level, for example, of the Declaration of Independence. So this would be, let's say, my early uh, re, re, how should we say, re, refutals, rebutals to your initial to your initial point. But let's go now to Atlas Rag because. Uh, if I understand well, both for, for you and for me, poly, the political aspect of the philosophy is the most interesting of it. So tell us a bit more about uh, how you view Atlas Rugged and, and you spoke about the strikers, by the way, obviously, spoilers alert, as a vanguard. And uh, tell us what are the things you liked about the politics of Atlas Rugged and what are the things you don't like. And we'll elaborate more on the on the latter. Uh, yeah, so... Uh... Another thing that I find really frustrating about commentators on Rand is um, that her detractors claim that she's a bad writer, right? Um, you know, one-dimensional characters and all this stuff. And I, I, I just I don't see it at all. I read Atlas Shrugged. I read Atlas Shrugged in you know tenth grade, and and I just um, I think it's amazing that it's gripping, right? It's just a uh, the plot, the mystery of it. Um, you know, just these 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 characters um i i find really interesting um and the whole plot of the strike and just finding finding the destroyer who is the destroyer is there a destroyer at all um that's that's just to me hard to hard to put down um actually uh once so part parts one and two of atlas Shrugged, um i i feel that way part three um when everything sort of comes out into the open is i think when atlas Shrugged gets a little bit um more boring like I, I feel like you can put the book down at that point um like Dagny's romances uh with both Francisco you know, spoiler alerts uh and and Hank are um are really believable um and I I don't find uh her her romance with uh with Galt as as believable at all like I just I, I think it just flies in the face of how relationships actually work um Okay, wait, wait, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Let's pause here. Yeah, sure. Because in some ways, so my favorite romance in Atlas Rock is not the Dagny God, but I find it quite believable. So because you meet someone who in a way you've been after your whole life in terms of an archetype, but even more practically, you've been after that person for like, I don't know, at that point, almost a year to find who is... A, to find who is the person who created the machine and who is the person who is the destroyer. So she's been after him in some way. So there's already this kind of, how to put it, a libidinal kind of build up. But that scene where she's in his house and uh, they both know that they want each other, but they have to stay apart because it's not yet the right moment. I found this very believable and very something that I was like, okay, this person knows about this. This person captures the essence of this burning, uh, this burning passion uh, inside. But let's, let's proceed and we will, we will keep disagreeing uh, as we go on. Yeah, just, just on that, the reason I don't find it believable is um, mainly because of her relation with, uh, with Hank. So um, I think I could understand her having like an affair with Galt or even like an open relationship and, and given Rand's own like personal um, personal relationship history, um, I, I, I think, I, I think uh, the idea of, of like open relationships and in, 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 uh, polyamory and Atlas Shrugged is, is really unfortunately like under, under uh, I wish for Rand's own sake that she would have explored that a little bit more. Um, but but I, I don't wait, but yeah. how can if you meet so she has problems with rare gen okay not problems but 
Reardon has some flaws that are quite detrimental to their relationship. So I think it's quite honest that when she meets the guy who is the guy of her dreams, says, okay, Hank, I've already kind of uh, forgotten you. And in a way, she doesn't cheat to the one with the other. So first she finishes the one thing. So I think that's way more honest than the what you described as, uh, as polyamory. So I won't go into the personal life thing because we could discuss this for oh, yeah, yeah. for 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 hours but yeah i i don't think that polyamory works but then again i'm no, she, it does, it's not guy, there so. <laughs> it's not in the text um and she does you know dagny is a serial monogamous she doesn't you know there's there is no polyamory actually in the text i, I just i think that there could have been man it would have been, okay. been believable um, I don't think that she is over uh, Hank, though. I think she still loves Hank. Um, and a lot of the flaws with Hank are actually like he improves on that, you know, with Dagny's help. Like he has this puritanical, like kind of self-loathing and self, self, especially self-sexual disgust um, that he largely gets over, like by the by the time uh, part three rolls around. Um, and I think that uh, Rand's idea that um, we are always uh, in our in our romantic, you know, love life, we are always seeking like somebody who most expresses or, uh, or most you know kind of mirrors or resonates with our our, our deepest values. Um, I think that we look for that, but I think when we when we you know build a relationship, then I think we have a commitment and. Um, and then we we foster uh, that commitment. We foster those those bonds that we choose to form. Um, and it would be a little bit weird if if um, if everyone you know was always like going to leave their their romantic partner at the drop of a hat. You know, the next time, the, you know, as soon as they find somebody who like you know more closely like matches their values or something. Um, so someone someone asked Pikov about this in his podcast, and actually uh-huh. Pikov agrees with uh, with this that obviously we know that if at some point you fall in love with someone it makes sense that you have to end so it's not just for everyone it's not good if you stay with someone who you don't love if you saw someone else more but Pico says if then you tell to your person when you start a relation look you are dispensable because at some point I might find that he right. said that is ridiculous or something like that. So I think there's also the element there of the plot of the novel and yeah. uh, with the, the, so I don't think the message is, you know, if you are with someone, they're always uh, dispensable or uh, what's, right. the, what's the term, but let's go, let's go to the, to the strike as a vanguard. Mm-hmm. So part of your criticism to the, to the model, to the, to the, you seem to imply that society collapses because of the strike, that the strikers, I think you, you, you put it something like orchestrate or something like that, they collapse. Elaborate a bit on this because I'm not sure we're on the same page. Okay, sure. So um, the, a, a strike of a, of a thousand people in, in real life is not going to... Um, cause a societal collapse. Even if you take, you know, a thousand of of the most brilliant people, you know, by by any metric or no metric, just you know, kind of a, a god's eye view metric, the thousand best people, society is going to still be able to keep the lights on. Um, so what Rand does, though, is um, in her worldview, in her world building, she. Uh, makes it so that uh, so that a, a strike of a thousand or so people um, would cause that damage. So so society is so corrupt. Um, you know, normal people, your your everyday citizens, are so out to lunch um, and and you know just not caring about anything. They're um, uh, it's it's like dystopian, right? Um, and everyone has lost the will to to live in in like a fully human way right um and and the average person is just really incompetent um and and all of this stuff so she builds that in um and then the and and so it's hard to talk about right because um you know in the actual novel 
Um, all of this is in the background. This has already happened. This is in her world building. You know, it's in the space between the between the lines. Um, uh, but it, it it matters, right? And I, I take issue with that um, because real life doesn't go that way. So in the novel, um, the strikers are uh, scrupulously nonviolent, except for Ragnar, sort of. Um, so they're scrupulously nonviolent. And so there is no like violation of what the libertarians call the non-aggression principle and all of this stuff. They, they merely like remove their, uh, the, the sanction of the victim, right? So the strikers, they remove their um, um, approval. Um, they remove themselves from society and whatever happens to society uh, is sort of society's problem. We just want to you know, live our lives um, alone. And that would be sort of like a Benedict option, you know, just going into seclusion and living and, and, and you know, being free. Um, but there is the express purpose of, of going out and uh, re, relighting the, the, the candle in the darkness, right? So uh, the, the lights of New York are going to go out, but the express intention of Galt and his strikers is to turn them back on, right? They are going to go out, back out into the world. And they are going to um, bring bring the freedom that they uh, you know that they have secured for themselves uh, to the outer world. But the way that that is nonviolent, and the way that that is sort of like on paper, it's okay, is only because of the world building that Rand has done, right? right. Where where people are kind of pathetic and and incapable of keeping the lights on themselves. Okay, two two points here. Turns out we don't agree. Eh, sorry, we don't disagree as much as I thought. So, because my objection to you would be that the strikers mostly pull off the veil that they show the corruption of the society. So, in a way, the corruption the society falls by itself. In in a way, it reminds me a bit the. And maybe that's not a great example. I just came up with it. In a way, the February Revolution in Russia. It's not that the revolutionaries did anything despite the mythology, it's mostly that the Tsarist regime collapsed because no one wanted to support it. In this case, the people who are capable of supporting it are just saying, okay, we're not supporting you anymore, mm -hmm. and it collapses on its own way. So now, Ran herself would agree that, yes, if you take out, let's say, 100 brilliant minds, the lights of society are not going to collapse. But because it's a book, this dramatization does work. And if you ask me, I wish it would be like that because I think in my heart, I'm always, I'm still a revolutionary in terms of I would like to see not the lights go down, but I would like to see, you know, a vast uh, radical change for the better towards what you, what you described so nice as, you know, a human, like a, a perfectionist, a human, a human flourishing. So I, I think that the strikers are doing something good and they're doing something which is quite virtuous. Now, and we're going to get to my biggest objection to your article, which is on how Rand sees the average person or the poor. But before that, let's see some super chats. So many thanks to Marilyn. Michael says there is no honest critique of objectivism. Michael, I would disagree with that uh, because even if we think someone is wrong, they, they can be dishonest or they can just be wrong or they can have a point. Thank you, Bonnie. Marlon says, Ram said that racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. She had limited time to write on current events. I think she knew what was happening regarding racism. So Marilyn, I would say, if you think about other issues, for example, for environmentalism, she also wrote one big article and she considers she said everything that was to be said. I think with racism, the, the magnitude of the topic was so big that it definitely required, the, required more attention. But again, to her, to her uh, how to put it, to her credit, I think she wrote one of the, if not the best philosophical attack on racism, first of all, as an epistemological problem. Shruti with, I assume this is Indian rupee, says this is an excellent interview. Thank you very much, Shruti. So, Paul, let's go now to the main issue that uh, I want to take with your with your algorithm, which is how Rand views the the poor and not only the poor, but let's say the average person. So you mentioned that uh, 
run you mentioned two things the first is that runs heroes frequently so contempt for the poor and the other thing you mentioned is the expendability of the mediocre so that the mediocre people in atlas rugged perish and this is something which is uh, indeed we can see it happen now let me tell you why i object first of all to the fact that rand uh, has contempt for the poor so the example you give is it's an interesting example which is an early example is when Dagny measured herself against both her peers and the adults around her. So I agree with this. Dagny is very, in a way, she's aristocratic with the actual term of the world, the, the Greek, like she's an aristos. But notice that these people are not poor. These people are empty, rich people who haven't got anything spiritually going on or in any way going on. So she's just saying, I found you boring. And she's just saying, I wish this world would be more interesting around these boring people. And notice that the peak of your boredom is, uh, is her, how it's called, coming out uh, party. I don't not coming out, how it's called. Uh, her debut party that mm -hmm. was this Debut. Old. Yeah. But the guests in the party, none of them are, are poor. So that's the one thing. And the second, which I think there's more essence there, is that the expendability of the mediocre. So again, do you, th do you think that Ayn Rand basically says, if you're mediocre, you don't deserve to flourish or to perish? Because I think what she's saying is that if you're mediocre and you live in a system which does not help the most able of you to pull you up, you're going to stay at the level of where you are. So let's put it this way. Where would I be without the person who created the Zoom? So without, let's say, Silicon Valley, I would be teaching in a physical classroom, let's say. Now, this is not to say I would probably not live where I'd want to live. I lived for 16 years in the US because of people who are better than me, not in any moral way, better in terms of their mind, I have a job where I teach for an institute which is based in the United States. So I don't think this is a condemnation of mediocrity in any moral way. So Eddie Willis, who is someone you mentioned, we see that Rand and the heroes care about him. And by the way, I don't think he perishes at the, at the end. So, so would, you, would you say that Rand does a moral condemnation of the poor or of the mediocre? And if yes, why? So, so I want to say first that um, when I actually started writing this, um, I, so when I started my reread, and, and the whole way that this whole started was I just had an itch to reread Atlas Shrugged. It had been like over 10 years. Um, and, and so I started reading it, and I had this idea in my head that, that uh, Rand only had contempt for, because I remembered some things like, like Dagny's uh, kind of attitude toward you know, people that she found boring. And I remember the 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 physicalization of, of uh, her villains as, as ugly people um, and, and the physicalization of her heroes as all, you know, sort of uh, very attractive, sharp lines, you know, mostly blonde, except for Francisco. Um, and, and that's what I had in my mind. But, and that's what I plan to write about. But when I actually read Alice Shrugged, I, I had to walk that back. Um, and I think where I come from now is she is conflicted. So I think that she has this, um, uh, you know, she was influenced by Nietzsche, right? And so I, I think that she has this um, kind of like, um, you know, this Aristotelian, not Aristotelian, uh, this aristocratic um, uh, sense of, of like, you know, there are people out there who are just like these these heroes um, and that uh, the the masses, you know, the diffuse masses um, are, are just, you know, they're they're worthless. Right. They're they're just uh, kind of just I don't know how to say it. It's, you know, um, you don't have to be concerned with them. They don't matter. Um, but but when I was reading Atlas Shrugged, you know, there is that. I, I do find those things. Um, and there is a physicalization that I talk about. 
Um, and there is sort of like uh, her, her uh, I think there are some examples of her showing contempt of for uh, not specific people as much as, as just like the, the mass of people. Um, but then there are these examples of, of just plain workers, uh, like the ones who who cheer Dagny as the John Galt line is 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 making its its uh, maiden voyage or whatever, um, and you know I think I talk about like the the really good relations that that Hank and Francisco have with their workers, right? So these are just just workers, you know. They're they're not even necessarily the educated workers. They're just you know the the linemen and so forth. Um, so I think Rand is just conflicted. I think she so, she shows both. But what I mean by expendability is, um, I don't think that you could write about this uh, the strike and the societal collapse that comes from it without thinking, you know, um, the most important thing is that we uh, we live our values and nothing matters in a practical sense to what happens to other people. Um, so a lot of people do die from the strike. Um, and more than that, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, I, I especially think of like children uh, who you don't know what kind of people they're going to be. They're going to be like the nine-year-old Dagny, but they're not going to have uh, the resources um, or the opportunities to become that, right? They're going to go hungry, you know, because they, their refrigerator has lost power, right? Um, and, and so I think that there is some, some sense of like expendability. Now, I, one thing that I still have from Rand is that capitalism should be celebrated. The, the creative potential of entrepreneurial capitalism um, should be celebrated because uh, it has led to um, you know, immense improvements in standard of living, just incomprehensible, you know, hockey stick graph kind of, kind of stuff. Um, um, but uh, Richard Feynman, you know, talking about nanotechnology said that there's, there's a lot of room at the bottom and I, I think that you can say something similar for, um, for like kind of social analysis and, and for, for economics. I think there is a lot of untapped and unfostered uh, potential um, in all of society um, and in the, the bottom rungs of society. And that's in one society, um, you know, on a broader scale, the, the globe, um, you know, I mean, there are people in poor parts of the world where um, you know they don't have they're not plugged into markets right um, they're not plugged into uh, you know the the you know richly capitalized markets of of the West and of Japan and you know uh, other advanced economies um, and they should be right um, you know if if we're all kind of like moral equals to at, at the beginning um, so that is that is what I would say. So, okay, so you raised three interesting points. The first is, I don't know if you've seen the Twitter meme which says physiognomy is real. So it's, uh, which, which, so Rand definitely has this, that someone's character, but again, it's the dramatization in yep. the book that someone's character is portrayed. Now, I wouldn't say though that they are necessarily beautiful. Think about Rourke. No one likes Rourke. Even even he shows up to the party, and that I think it's Kiki Holcomb or what's here. She says uh, to to Dominique, "Did you like that guy?" And Dominique realizes, "Oh, no one sees him as beautiful because maybe objectively he's not like uh, you know what he's he's not like a, a, a Brad Pitt or Mike, the Rourke's friend, who is both poor. And as Rand describes him, he's, it sounds like he's oh, he's so ugly." That it's almost a spectacle, but again, because he's because he's this moral character, uh, we see him as a as a nice uh, as a nice figure. I would say even Galt, that at some point Dagny asks, uh, I think the secretary of uh, of someone who she arrives a bit late, and Galt has taken someone and they've left, and says, "Who was the guy who came in?" And the secretary says. I wouldn't say I couldn't say how he looked. So it's not like he he, but it's that you know you see someone and they have this I don't know moral clarity in their face and that's the dramatization. So I don't think it's a let's say a, how to put it like a, a eugenic style that only the mm -hmm. the, the best like. Uh, then about uh, the victims of the strike. Now this is a very difficult topic 
because there's also the scene with the train uh, disaster. Oh and God, I write about that too, I think. Sorry? I, I think I write about that too. Yeah, so where literally kids die and their mothers put them to bed before they die. And this is a difficult scene. But again, the question is, do they, two questions. The first question is, do they die because of the strike or because of the policies? And with the train, I think it's very clear that particularly the train has nothing to do with the strike, that the train has to do with every little thing that the people who are, let's say, the opponents of the strike are doing. But here's the most important question. And here we might disagree on the morality of the story. Should the strikers give up their lives and the values so that other people wouldn't perish for the mistake of, let's say, the government, to put it simply, or the bad elites? So that's the big question. Do you think that, let's say, Francisco and uh, Reardon and all these people should keep working so that there wouldn't be innocent victims? Because, of course, there are innocent victims. So that's the difficult question. Because if we ask this question in the positive, then we'd have to say, let's say, to Reardon, look, your number one priority should be to keep bailing out bad people so that innocent people don't perish. Um, yeah, so, so first with the, with the train crash, um, she, she very explicitly makes it so that every single person on that train, um, you know, em, embodied horrible values, right? Um, but it didn't have to be that way. Rand put those people, those specific people there, right? Um, and it could have been that um, Dagny could have been on that train, you know, like, and, and then, and then uh, somebody who, who is, is, um, Oh, sorry, Dagny specifically, no, because Dagny well, should say, yeah. what are you doing? We're not going to that tunnel. Yeah, <laughs> yes. The, but, yeah. But, but, but somebody... Not Dagny, I mean, you as an engineer, you would say, wait, what are you doing, guys? Why are we going there? So it's almost the criticism of this idea that, yeah, whatever, whatever the authorities say, we're going to do it. Uh-huh. Um, but then to, uh, to the other issue of, of whether, you know, Hank and Francisco should, should keep working, I, I, I don't accept the, the dichotomy here. So I think this is part of, of uh, you know, Rand's ideal system, um, ideal theory, where um, she has this all worked out in her mind and then she applies it to the real world. Um, but I think that we are, we are always like already thrown into society with its, its uh, history, its obligations, its laws, its political conflicts. Um, so the question is always like, where to go from here, uh, right? Where to go with the, the obligations that we have, where to go with the, the social relations that we have, um, you know, in, not in personal relationships so much as um, where to go with the, the social relations of like, who is at the top, uh, who, who isn't, um, who has, uh, you know, kind of political power, which social classes, uh, you know, have influence and all of this, whether you're talking about, you know, women, uh, you know, versus men, or whether you're talking about race or whatever. So, um, I, you know, I just think it would be really interesting to, to take somebody like Rand, take Rand's values of um, uh, the creative, you know, potential of, of capitalism and not just that, but the, the, the freedom of, of, of the entrepreneur, um, and, and put them, you know, start, take those ideas and think about them from society as it actually exists today, right? Rather than um, idealizing it, this is what a perfect world would look like, which is Galt Gulch, um, a perfect world where, you know, everyone already has the relations um, that, that Rand thinks are appropriate. Everyone is, um, you know, treating each other like a, like a trader. Um, they're trading value for value. Um, uh, etc. Right. So that's not right. what we have here. Right. Okay. So two comments on, on this. So, 
So there are two things. I think when we set principles, I think we should go for this, uh, what you said, uh, let's say, ideal. So for example, what would the ideal society look like or a proper society, because ideal is, I don't know, a bit platonic in my years, but let's say the proper society. I would say, for example, it should, and Rand said, it should take out all the initiation of force. I would agree with that. Now, if you say, for example, if you have a button and you press it now, and let's say the coercive elements of the nationalized healthcare disappears, do you press it? The answer is obviously no. People rely on it today. People have paid on it. People have not paid, but they're going exactly. to have their next chemotherapy and they think that it's going to be there tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. so I think these are two different things. So on, a, on, on the level of coming up with principles, I do think that, yes, you should say these are the principles. Now, on the level of politics, where do you go there tomorrow? Of course, you take into accordance some things and you take into accordance, let's say, what would be this tradition. So again, I will push you back a bit on going back to the beginning of the discussion. I don't think that Trump is presenting a, an ideal society. And this is actually, we, interestingly enough, many anarcho-capitalists say to Rand, look, in gold's gold, there is no government. And Rand says, no, but that's not, a, that's not an ideal uh, state. And one more disagreement that I just remembered and we'll, we'll finish with, uh, with this. I think you mentioned that there are no disagreements or conflicts in, among uh, the heroes, but I think there are. And the biggest conflict, for example, is <laughs> Reardon doesn't want to go on strike or Dagny knows about the strike and doesn't want to go on strike. So there is a constant, in a way, the whole book, if you think about it, is a conflict among the good people. So uh, let me ask you and finish with, with this, because that was a, the difficult, uh, the, one of the central themes in your article. So you say, quote, good rational people simply do see the world from different angles and come to different conclusions. Parenthesis, I agree. Continuing the quote. And democratic politics is in part about managing these differences peacefully. So the claim you're making is that in real life, as you put it, we need politics, we need democracy to negotiate these differences between people. And I was trying to think of an example, but to be honest with you, I couldn't. So could you give an example of what you mean where good, honest people disagree and the solution can come through politics? Um, yes. So, uh, so, I mean, I, th I think of this as kind of just the natural state, but, um, I'm trying to think of a, of a, of just a, a plain example. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to, um, organize, uh, healthcare, say, um, and people have have disagreements with this, um, and you know some could be as as good as another. Um, so a lot of uh, of uh, like medical results, uh, like uh, health, you know, comprehensive kind of like health outcomes uh, on a just a national statistical level are are better in um, you know countries uh, in Europe um, over America. Um, but they all have different systems, right? Um, and those those are different, but they they ultimately just like aligned on something, right? Um, and America has this this you know just completely kind of like sclerotic system that uh, is is based on you know like employer uh, you know based health insurance, um, and it doesn't have to be that way. It's it's just from history. Um, but we seem to have. Uh, you know, with with a with Americans uh, with American capitalism and, and kind of our history of and, and our you know beliefs about capitalism and stuff like this, we could have like a much freer market um, version of of healthcare that would reach uh, that would achieve like better income uh, better uh, outcomes, um, but we never we we can't align on that, um, um, and we have. Uh, you know, people on say the right, the political right, who who want to uh, achieve, who want to do that, who want the free market version, which could be better, 
uh, than the status quo. And you you have people on the left who who want something more like like uh, the the British NHS, the Nationalized Health Service. Um, but they don't get that either. That's not possible politically in America. Um, but either one would be better than what we have here. Um, and like, if you could, you know, just like if you could vote and choose one system over the other, like either would be better. Um, and that is a that is a, a conflict um, where uh, I think um, both sides aren't at fault. They don't believe anything fundamentally false. They have good ideas uh, supporting their beliefs, right? Um, you know, I think there are good arguments for, uh, you know, for a, a more free market version of, of healthcare that doesn't, that isn't based on employer-based health insurance, because that's not a free market at all. Um, but then, you know, people on the left can just like point to countries in Europe and say, if we just modeled this, we have an example of this working a lot better than what we have. Um, so neither side is really at, at fault. They're, they're not making uh, horrible, you know, epistemic mistakes. Um, is, I don't know. Maybe that's a bad example. It's hard to think of a good example. No, I, I get what you're saying, but I'm going to go all Nozick uh, framework for utopia here. So <laughs> I, I think this this goes back to what I was trying to to I have, was having this internal dialogue with your with your article and I was saying, but wait a minute, wouldn't the best solution be to navigate these disagreements on a voluntary basis? For example, you might think that this is the best way to organize healthcare. Great, more power to you. You have your uh, co-op, your uh, charity, your uh, commune, however we want to call it, or your uh, mixed system where uh, the employer pays something there, something else. But the one thing for me which would be non-negotiable is that I shouldn't coerce you and you shouldn't coerce me when it comes to the decision on which system to, to decide. And because in my mind, politics is directly linked to at some point down the road, the application of force and the, the use of force, that's why I can't wrap my mind around, since we agree that there can be disagreement even among rational people, why then would politics make it better? The way I see it, politics would make this, this, this disagreement even more, it would in a way raise the stakes because now it's uh, my way or your way and we can't both be happy. Right, so it's just that um, you, you sometimes just have to align on something. Uh, the, it's, it's never the best of, of all possible worlds, uh, but aligning on on something is better than than uh, not aligning at all. Um, so you can uh, like uh, Jerry Gauss is a is a liberal philosopher who who, who passed away recently. Um, but he he's very good to read on this um, uh, on just how we um, how social coordination actually happens. Um, and it, you know you're never finding the best, the optimal world um, because people disagree. But just aligning on just about anything is better than than like a conflict of all against all, for example. Um, and the the maintenance, uh, like part, like once you actually do align on a, on some system of rules, then you have to enforce those rules um, because the rules become uh, unstable if they're not enforced. So if free riders uh, uh, aren't punished in some, some way um, or deterred in some way, maybe punish isn't always the right word, but just deterred. Um, you know, an, an example of this is like driving on the left side of the road versus the right side of the road. Neither is intrinsically, um, you know, more moral than the other, but you gotta pick one. And once you do pick one, you have to make sure, you have to enforce that everyone follows the same convention. Um, and, and that applies, you know, broadly. So that, uh, that is an example. I mean, okay, there's also the low hanging fruit that if the road was private, you do what you want. But for example, <laughs> on issue of uh, foreign policy, it would be a, an area where even on a, a rights, uh, let's say, respecting the way I see it system, you would need some, uh, shall we call it, I don't want to call it consensus, but something like, like, okay, are we voting for the guy who is warning us that Russia is a big danger or the guy who is warning us that that other guy is wrong? So let's uh, 
So uh, particularly in issues like that, I think there is a space for uh, democracy, but in everything else, I would, I mean, obviously we would disagree here that uh, I would say my first rule would be you are free to do your own thing, but don't coerce me to, to go with your three. So we, we've been on for 56 uh, minutes and we didn't even manage to discuss the one other theme of the art, which is wh wh where, sorry, whether Rand is closer to conservatism. I would, say, I would say, spoiler alert, that the answer is particularly, definitely no, but particularly these days with the abortion debate, uh, you can see how conservatives are uh, way off the tail. And uh, it's so during the weekend, I was rereading stuff, not only about Rand and abortion, but around Rand on con and conservatives. So I, I think you, uh, we would disagree here. I think even quantitatively, perhaps he spent more time criticizing uh, conservatives and uh, her vitriol the justified vitriol against them, particularly on the issue of abortion, is uh, is I think uh, is, is is quite interesting. But uh, Paul, we we are running out of uh, time. I think this was a, a good discussion. So some people might say, why did you have this uh, discussion? You, well, it's important for two reasons. One is I think it was an interesting discussion. B is from an let's say activist point of view. I'm very interested to hear. What does a good intention people not like about Rand? Because in my mind, it's like, how can you read Atlas Rag and not be a hundred percent sold? So I think it's a it's a it's it's a good uh, discussion. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for reaching out with uh, with your uh, with your article. And uh, in the past, if you write something else about uh, about Rand, might be interesting to. Uh, chatting with you again. So again, for the people who might might want to check it out, the article is in Liberal Currents and is called Liberalism versus Reaction in Ayn Rand by Paul, and it was published in early May 2022. Paul, thank you very much for your time and all the best. Thanks. Okay? I, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.